Hello friends, I'm Rick Warren and welcome to Spurgeon Sermons. This is the official podcast brought to you by Premier and Spurgeon's College. You know, the teachings of Charles Spurgeon have had a personal impact on my life in a profound way, and I'm confident they'll do the same for you. So get ready to be challenged, equipped, and guided by Charles Spurgeon, who is universally regarded as the greatest English preacher in the history of the church. Supposing him to be the gardener. A sermon by Charles Spurgeon, part four. Supposing him to be the gardener. John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 15. I am sometimes troubled by the question, what if roots of bitterness should spring up among us to trouble us? We are all such fallible creatures, supposing some brother should permit the seed of discord to grow in his bosom. Then there may be a sister in whose heart the seeds will also spring up, and from her they will fly to another sister and be blown about till brethren and sisters are all bearing rue and wormwood in their hearts. Who is to prevent this? Only the Lord Jesus by his Spirit. He can keep out this evil, supposing him to be the gardener. The root which bears wormwood will grow but little where Jesus is. Dwell with us, Lord, as a church and people, By your Holy Spirit, reside with us and in us, and never depart from us, and then no root of bitterness shall spring up to trouble us. Then comes another fear, supposing the living waters of God's Spirit should not come to water the garden. What then? We cannot make them flow, for the Spirit is a sovereign, and he flows where he pleases. Ah, but the Spirit of God will be in our garden, supposing our Lord to be the gardener. There is no fear of our not being watered when Jesus undertakes to do it. He will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. But what if the sunlight of his love should not shine on the garden, if the fruits should never ripen, if there should be no peace? No joy in the Lord. That cannot happen, supposing him to be the gardener. For his face is the sun, and his countenance scatters those health-giving beams and nurturing warmths and perfecting influences which are needful for maturing the saints in all the sweetness of grace to the glory of God. So supposing him to be the gardener, At this, the close of the year, I fling away my doubts and fears and invite you who bear the church upon your heart to do the same. It is all well with Christ's cause, because it is in his own hands. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Fifthly, here is a warning for the careless supposing him to be the gardener. In this great congregation, many are to the church what weeds are to a garden. They are not planted by God. They are not growing under his nurture. They are bringing forth no fruit to his glory. My dear friend, I have tried often to get at you, to impress you, but I cannot. Take heed. For one of these days, supposing him to be the gardener, he will reach you, and you shall know what the word means, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Take heed to yourselves, I pray. Others among us are like the branches of the vine which bear no fruit. We have often spoken very sharply to these, speaking honest truth in unmistakable language, and yet we have not touched their consciences. Ah, but supposing him to be the gardener, he will fulfil that sentence, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He will get at you, if we cannot. Would God, ere this old year were quite dead, 
you would turn unto the Lord with full purpose of heart, so that instead of being a weed, you might become a choice flower, that instead of a dry stick, you might be a sappy, fruit-bearing branch of the vine. The Lord make it to be so. But if any here need the caution, I pray them to take it to heart at once. Supposing him to be the gardener, there will be no escaping from his eye. There will be no deliverance from his hand, as he will thoroughly purge his floor and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So he will thoroughly cleanse his garden and cast out every worthless thing. Another set of thoughts may well arise as a quietus to those who complain, supposing him to be the gardener. Certain of us have been made to suffer much physical pain, which often bites into the spirits and makes the heart to stoop. Others have suffered heavy temporal losses, having had no success in business, but on the contrary, have had to endure privation, perhaps even to extreme poverty. Are you ready to complain against the Lord for all this? I pray you do not so. Take the supposition of the text into your mind this morning. The Lord has been pruning you sharply, cutting off your best boughs, and you seem to be like a thing despised that is constantly tormented with the knife. Yes, but supposing him to be the gardener, suppose that your loving Lord has wrought it all, that from his own hand all your grief has come. Every cut and every gash and every slip, does not this alter the case? Hath not the Lord done it? Well then, if it be so, put your finger to your lip and be quiet until you are able from your heart to say, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. I am persuaded that the Lord hath done nothing amiss to any one of his people, that no child of his can rightly complain that he has been whipped with too much severity, and that no one branch of the vine can truthfully declare that it has been pruned with too sharp an edge. No. What the Lord has done is the best that could have been done. The very thing that you and I, if we could have possessed infinite wisdom and love, would have wished to have done. Therefore let us stop each thought of murmuring and say, The Lord hath done it, and be glad. Especially I speak to those who have suffered bereavement. I can hardly express to you how strange I feel at this moment when my sermon revives a memory so sweet, dashed with such exceeding bitterness. I sat with my friend and secretary in that garden some fifteen days ago, and we were then in perfect health, rejoicing in the goodness of the Lord. We returned home and within five days I was smitten with disabling pain. And worse, far worse than that, he was called upon to lose his wife. We said to one another as we sat there reading the word of God and meditating, how happy we are. Dare we think of being so happy? Must it not speedily end? I little thought I should have to say for him, alas, my brother, Thou art brought very low, for the delight of thine eyes is taken from thee. But here is our comfort. The Lord hath done it. The best rose in the garden is gone. Who has taken it? The gardener came this way and gathered it. He planted it and watched over it, and now he has taken it. Is not this most natural? Does anybody weep because of that? No, everybody knows that it is right, and according to the order of nature, that he should come and gather the best in the garden. 
if you are sore troubled by the loss of your beloved, yet dry your grief by supposing him to be the gardener. Kiss the hand that has wrought you such grief. Brothers and sisters, remember the next time the Lord comes to your part of the garden, and he may do so within the next week. He will only gather his own flowers, and would you prevent his doing so even if you could? Supposing him to be the gardener, then there is an outlook for the hopeful. Supposing him to be the gardener, then, I expect to see in the garden where he works the best possible prosperity. I expect to see no flower dried up, no tree without fruit. I expect to see the richest, rarest fruit, with the daintiest bloom upon it, daily presented to the great owner of the garden. Let us expect that in this church and pray for it. Oh, if we have but faith, we shall see great things. It is our unbelief that straightens God. Let us believe great things from the work of Christ, by his Spirit, in the midst of his people's hearts, and we shall not be disappointed. Supposing him to be the gardener then, dear friends, we may expect divine intercourse of unspeakable preciousness. Go back to Eden for a minute. When Adam was the gardener, what happened? The Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. But supposing him to be the gardener, then we shall have the Lord God dwelling among us and revealing himself in all the glory of his power and the plenitude of his fatherly heart, making us to know him, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. What joy is this? One other thought. Supposing him to be the gardener and God to come and walk among the trees of the garden, then I expect he will remove the whole of the garden upward with himself to fairer skies. For he rose, and his people must rise with him. I expect a blessed transplanting of all these flowers below to a clearer atmosphere above away from all this smoke and fog and damp, up where the sun is never clouded, where flowers never wither, where fruits never decay. Oh, the glory we shall then enjoy up yonder, on the hills of spices, in the garden of God. Supposing him to be the gardener, what a garden will he form above? And how shall you and I grow therein? developing beyond imagination. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Since he is the author and finisher of our faith, to what perfection will he conduct us, and to what glory will he bring us? Oh, to be found in him, God grant that we may be, to be plants in his garden, supposing him to be the gardener, is all the heaven we can desire. Thank you for listening, friends. This podcast was brought to you by Premier in association with Spurgeon's College. For more Christian podcasts, sermons, and music, head back to the website premier.plus and sign in for free.